Creatures, Arch Demon. I'm not sure how far we got. I think we had nothing except that bit. The false dragon gods of the Tevinter Imperium lie buried deep within the earth, where they have been imprisoned since the Maker cast them down. No one knows what it is that drives dark spawn in their relentless search for the sleeping old gods. Perhaps it is instinct, as moths will fly to torch flames. Perhaps there is some remnant of desire for vengeance upon the ones who goaded the Magisters to assault heaven. Whatever the reason, when Darkspawn find one of these be ancient dragons, it is immediately afflicted by the taint. It awakens twisted and corrupted and leads the Darkspawn, the Darkspawn in a full-scale invasion of the land, a blight. Othamiel was once the Tevinta god of beauty. In ancient times he was worshipped by musicians, artists and poets. The feast of Othamiel was the grandest celebration of the year, an event that lasted a full twelve days. Plays and entire symphonies were written in his honour. Now he is a maddened husk of his former self, filled with nothing but a desire to destroy all life. When the first flight began, many brave and th men and women threw themselves at Dumat, the first archdemon, trying to strike him down. But no matter the numbers, no matter their strength, he would always return. This was proof, some said, of his divine power. But the Grey Wardens soon learned otherwise. The tainted blood bound them to the Archdemon, and they could hear it, feel it, as it died and was born anew, its spirit drawn to possess the nearest tainted creature. The Darkspawn were mindless, soulless, empty shells of, of flesh that could be bent and remade in the dragon's image. But a man, a man's soul was not so malleable. When a Warden's hand struck the fa fatal blow against Humid, the old god's spirit was drawn, not to a Darkspawn, but to the man who had slain him. At that moment, the soul of, the b of both the warden and the archdemon were utterly destroyed, and the dragon rose no more. The blight was over. Items. The Summer Sword. In 848, Blessed, Lord Aurelian of Montsemar, champion of the Grand Tourney of Ansberg, commissioned a sword for his youngest son, Louis, who aspired to the Chevaliers. Insisting that his boy have nothing but the best, Lord Aurelian sought out the most renowned master smith in the Olesian Empire, Versen of Harlem Shirel, who was at that time nearly eighty and begged the old man to make the blade. Vassan refused. His sight was failing him, and he had no wish to come out of retirement. But Aurelian offered the an exorbitant sum of gold, and eventually overcame the artisan's resistance. The old master labored for several months, folding steel, honing the edge, edge to perfection. The resulting blade was as long as a man is tall, and sharp as the tongue of any noblewoman. Vassan proclaimed it to be his greatest work, and named it, in a fit of irony, the summer sword, since he had crafted it in the winter of his lifetime. Lord Aurelian brought, Lu brought Louis with him to receive the sword from the hand of the old master. When the boy saw the summer sword, he turned up his nose at his father's gift. Such great so two-handed blades were no longer in fashion at court. He preferred an estoc. Aurelian was mortified. He insisted that Louis carry the blade and apologized to Vassen, but to no avail. The swordsmith cursed the boy, saying that for his bride, regardless of, bla of blade he carried, he would fail anyway. Louis was eventually knighted and joined the ranks of the Chevaliers. In 898, blessed, he was appointed command of the Chevaliers in Denerim and hoped to make a name for himself. And so he did. He was the most detested Chevalier in Ferelden, well known for his acts of depravity. In 9-1 Dragon, he met Loghain MacTier in battle at Avenash. Louis lost his stock early in the fighting, became separated from his men, and ended up facing down Loghain himself, armed only with the summer sword, which he had never before drawn. Practice might have saved him with pride, where well, pride did not. Loghain made short work of the pompous chevalier and took the great sword as a trophy. Culture and history. Antiva. Ah, uh, okay. I'm not entirely sure. In the rest of the civilized world, it is common belief that Antiva has no king. I assure you, gentle readers, that this is untrue. The line of kings in Antiva has remained unbroken for two and a half thousand years. It is simply that nobody pays any attention to them whatsoever. The nation is ruled in truth by a collection of merchant princes. There are not princes in the literal sense, but ha heads of banks, trading companies and vineyards. The power is conferred strictly by wealth. I but Antiva is not primarily renowned for its peculiar... Pecu peculiar form of government, nor for its admittedly unparalleled wines. I think I had some of those, although I didn't know when. 
Antiva is known for the House of Crows. Since Antivans are well known for being good at everything but fighting, it is more than a little ironic that Antiva possesses with the most deadly assassins in the world. Their fame is such that Antiva keeps no standing army. No king is willing to order his troops to assault their borders, and no general is mad enough to lead such an invasion. The attack would likely succeed, but its leaders would not see today. From in pursuit of knowledge, travels of a chantry scholar by Brother Jenny TV. I was half certain I'd already read that. The City Elves when the holy exalted march of the Dales resulted in the dissolution of the elven kingdom, leaving a great many elves homeless once again, the divine Renata I declared that all her lands loyal to the Chantry must give the elves refuge within their own walls. Considering the atrocities committed by the elves at the Red Crossing, this was a great testament to the Chantry's charity. There was one condition, however. The elves were to lay aside the pagan gods and live under the rule of the Chantry. Some of the elves refused to our goodwill. They banded together to form the wandering Dalish elves, keeping their old elven ways and their hatred of humans alive. To this day, Dalish elves still terrorize those of us who stray too close to their camps. Most of the elves, however, saw that it was wisest to live under the protection of humans. And so we took the elves into our cities and tried to integrate them. We invited them, we invited them into our own homes and gave them jobs as servants and farmhands. Here in Denerim, the elves even have their own quarter, governed by an elven keeper. Most have proven to be productive members of societies. Still, a small segment of the elven community remains dissatisfied. These troublemakers and malcontents roam the streets causing mayhem, rebelling against authority and making a general nuisance of themselves. From Ferelden, Folklore and History by Sister Petrine Chantry Scholar. It's so brilliant how different she and Jenny TV are in writing. I can tell in the codex entry which, which of the two has written them. Because Jenny TV isn't like that. He's not so so typical chantry, nose up in the uh Ah, I hate this. Um, yes, I could go on. Alienage culture. There have always been alienages. They have been around for as long as, uh, as elves and shems have lived in the same lands. Ours isn't even the worst. They say that Val Royaux has 10,000 elves living in a space no bigger than Denarim's market. Their walls are supposedly so high that daylight doesn't reach the Vanadal until midday. But don't be so anxious to start tearing down the walls and picking fights with the guards. They keep out more than they keep in. We don't have to live here, you know. Sometimes a family gets a good break and they buy a house in the docks or the at the outskirts of town. If they're lucky, they come back to the alienage after the looters have burned their house down. The unlucky ones just go to the pauper's field. Here we are among family. We look out for each other. Here we do what we can to remember the old ways. The flatties who have gone out here, they are stuck. They'll never be human and they've gone out and thrown away, their <laughs> thrown away being elven too. So where does that leave them? Nowhere. Sarathia, heron of the higher alienage. Guaran. The human settlement of Guaran is built directly on top of the dwarven outpost by the same name. Prior to the first blight in a time when Ferelden was not yet a nation and was still carved up into barbarian tribes, the outpost served as a source of salt and means by which the dwarves could reach the sea lanes of the Amaranthine Ocean. Unwilling to come to the surface, the dwarves made an agreement with the local town to build a port and relied on the humans to ferry goods between the ships and the underground posts. Outpost. This made Guaran a prosperous place <laughs> and extraordinarily wealthy for a time. When, in the Divine Age, the Dwarven Kingdoms felt that the Darkspawn and the Deep Roads were closed off, so, did so too did the Dwarves disappear from Guaran. The human settlement, the envy of uh, surrounding barbarian tribes, was assaulted and sacked. It's worth stolen. Assaulted se settlement that sells salt. No, no, don't go there. The town remained, however, and despite its remote location, continued to find value as a sort of fish and timber. As the first settlement liberated by King Merrick and Loghain, King Merrick and Loghain during the Ferelden Rebellion, Guaran was eventually granted to Loghain when he became a turn in 9/11 Dragon. From Ferelden Folklore and History by Sister Petrine Chantry Scholar. Venadal, the tree of the people. Mostly the old ways are gone. Each generation forgets a little more of the old tongue, a little more of the traditions. And the little things we keep become simple habits, the meaning long since faded. So it is with the Vanadal, the tree of the people. Every alienage has one, I am told. Oh, they used to. When I was a little girl, my mother told me the tree was a symbol of Arlathan, but not even she knew more. Keeping the Vanadal is just a habit now. Many cities have let theirs wither and die, then chop them up for firewood. No great loss. Serethia, Haran of the Higher, Varelianage.
Characters. Queen Anora. I don't know if I had anything on her already. We have been given to th the gift of freedom by our forebears. Let us not squander it. The only child of the war hero Loghain Mactira, Nora has never been one to st stay quietly in the background. It is common knowledge that in the five years when Nora and Kaelin held the throne together, she was the one wielding the power. She is held in much, much higher esteem than her husband by the people of Ferelden, nobility and commoners alike, and commands the respect even of foreign nations. Having once inspired Empress Selina Valet to declare, Anora of Ferelden is a solitary rose among brambles. She sent her maid Alina to Alneman's estate to ask for Sigan's help in es escaping from Alhau, but as they fled House estate and Nora in disguise, they were ambushed by Sir Cothrian, there to arrest House murderer. A fight ensued, and Anora fled in the confusion. She made her way to Eamon's, uh, e to Eamon's Denerim estate and there offered her aid in defeating her father in the landsmeet. With her help, Loghain's support was eroded. The bands fell in line be here behind Eamon and Sigan. Loghain, however, would not accept defeat easily. He filled the room with troops and attempted a coup. Fighting erupted, breaking the long tradition of the landsmeet, which was ultimately settled with a duel. In the end, Anora was granted the throne, freeing Alistair from the burden of a responsibility he never wanted anyway. Sir Cothrian. Some of us know what honour and loyalty are. Cothrian came to look in service the hard way. She belonged to a poor family and was doing work on the farm when she saw a man on horseback being attacked by several bandits. She rushed to his assistance and found out belatedly that the man she saved was none other than the great hero Loghain. Though she was hardly more than a child, he took her in, offering her a position with his soldiers, and she climbed through the ranks through, th th bleh, through sheer determination. <laughs> Becoming the commander of Merrick's shield, Loghain's elite soldiers was the proudest moment of her life. She was slain while trying to arrest Sigyn for the murder of Al Hau. Al Iman Guerin. While the question of the succession set with the question of succession settled, Iman returned to Redcliffe to prepare the castle's defences for the encroaching blight. Al Rand and Hau. It appears it will be civil war after all, despite the darkspawn. Pity. The Arling of Amaranthine winds along the sinuous northeastern coast of Ferelden. The Waking Sea is known for its temper, and the storms that sweep it in from the warmer northern waters are sudden and brutal. These are the lands of Randon Howe. He was born during the op occupation, and like many of the nobles in that time, joined Prince Marek's rebels. He fought alongside young Bryce Coosland, future Tern of High Ever, and Leonus Bryland, future Earl of Southreach, at the bloody Battle of White River. It was the most catastrophic defeat of the entire occupation, from which only 50 rebel soldiers escaped alive. Although he was decorated for valor by King Merrick, Howe's abrasive manners have earned him almost a universal dislike amongst his peers. Howe died at the hands of Sigyn and Denerim. Loghain Mactia. Uh, I'm not sure that we had that for sure. I'm uh, starting here because I'm not sure. He then returned to Denerim and declared himself the regent to his daughter, Queen Anora, demanding that Ferelden follow him against the Darkspawn, upsetting a great many of the bands. His actions sparked a civil war. Loghain's supporters found themselves fighting their neighbors who blamed Loghain for the death of the king, as well as those who simply wished to take advantage of the power vacuum. vacuum. He was defeated in single combat at the landsmeet and summarily executed. Morrigan. On the eve of battle with the yes on the eve of battle with the archdemon she made an offer to the wardens sire a child with her and co she could use it to capture the archdemon's soul at the moment of death saving the warden who struck the killing blow morrigan's critical eye is not ah yes we had that that's just her preference for jewelry volendrian Remember that our strength lies in commitment to tradition and to each other. Every alienage has a harem, an elder. It falls to the harem to arrange marriages for those without family, to negotiate with the guards and there's when there's trouble, and to act as a sort of maya and surrogate uncle to the people of the alienage. The title, like so many things, is a holdover from the time of Arlathan, for harems not, are not necessarily the oldest person in the community, or even old at old. Tradition gives a role to the oldest soul, the wisest, cleverest, and the most level-headed. Valandrian was the harem of the Denerim alienage since he was in his thirties. He was nearly shipped to winter by slavers, but was returned to the alienage by Sigyn. Zebra and Aranai. Hmm. 
I am not entirely sure which bit I haven't read. And perhaps it's just that I intend to see this through to the end with you. After all, someone must take responsibility for preventing your untimely death. We certainly had that. Children. Yes, I think that was all. Books and songs. The first blight, chapter four. Found it at Weishaupt Fortress in the under first degree wardens offered humanity hope in its darkest hour. Veterans of, dec of decades of battles with the darkspawn came together and the best amongst them pledged to do whatever was necessary to stem the tide of darkness that swept across the land. These great humans, elves and dwarves, pulled their knowledge of the enemy and formed a united front to put a stop to the archdemon's rampage. And stop it they did. Ballads are still sung today of the first grey warden charge in the waves of darkspawn in the city of Nordbotten, each warden facing ten or twenty darkspawn at the time. Squadrons of grey wardens mounted on their mighty griffins, soaring through the blackened skies and battling the terrible arch demon with fear and spell. Oh, what a sight it must have been. Incredibly, the Grey Wardens won their first battle. They raised their army in victory and suddenly there was hope. The Grey Wardens led the land of men and, last and the last starboard defenders of the Dwarven Halls against the hordes of the Archdemon Dumat for the next hundred years, gaining and losing grounds. But never backing away, from all over Thedas they recruited whoever possessed the skill and strength to raise the Grey Wardens banner, making no distinction between elven slave or human nobleman, and finally, nearly two centuries after the first old god fro rose from the earth, the Grey Wardens assembled at the armies of men and dwarves at the Battle of the Silent Fields, it was then that the Umad finally fell and the first blight ended. The Tevinter Imperium would face a new challenge with the coming of the Prophet Andraste. Thoughts of the blight grew distant. With Dumat's defeat, the Darkspawn were no longer considered a threat. But with the wisdom and ha of hindsight, we know that conceit proved foolish indeed. The task of the Grey Wardens was far from over. From Tales of Destruction of Thetis by Brother Jenny TV, John Triscolon. Controls, army picker. Yeah, because we can do that and this, this guy's thing. Okay, that was all. Alright. 